I'm Sawyer, and you're listening to Our House A to Z. Okay, I've gotten a lot of questions about the ascot. <laughs> Got a lot of questions about them, serious questions? Yeah, I mean, you know, well ranging on a scale from life or death all the way down to just like, hey, what's that? You know? So. Yeah, I mean, because I guess it's not technically an ascot anyway, it's just a bandana tied around your neck. Well, it depends, I guess, on how you wear it, I think. Okay. Could like, I wrong. thought ascots were, like, a totally different thing, actually. Uh, I guess it could be. I don't know. It could be or it is. I'd call, I'd say it was an ascot, like, what the, the gala, what I wore to the gala. It's like a... Oh, because it's folded as an... You can fold something as an ascot. An I, ascot isn't an actual thing, like a tie that's a certain shape that you... I don't 100% know, but <laughs> it was a silk scarf. Oh, that, so, As opposed to a handkerchief. <laughs> a cotton handkerchief. <laughs> Yeah, okay, so... Well, I feel like this is a good question that we can ask for some feedback on. Okay. When your spouse makes a major commitment like this to do something different every single day... Not every day, but almost. Zachary Thomas... I didn't wear one yesterday. Yes, I did. Yes, you did. You was actually... You fell asleep with it still on. (laughs) (laughs) Thank God for my wife. I might have been strangled in the night. Well, I just said I don't think it's a good... I know know you're committed to this, but I feel like when you're sleeping, it's probably a good time to take it off because it's weird. Like when you have no shirt on and just the ascot, it's... I mean... Is it? Ascot, bandana thing. (laughs) I think it's... I think it's time to take it off at that point. (laughs) Uh... I just felt like I had to ask a couple weeks into it because it it really came out of nowhere. Yeah. There was nothing that, I mean, I'm sure there was something in you that was triggered to say today's the day that I will take a stand with the ascot and wear it every single day. <laughs> you know, like you knew it, you committed to it that day, but I feel if like that should. you don't stand should, for something, you'll fall for anything. I feel like <laughs> that should have been something that was a discussion with us. That's like, it's and, and almost... Our, and our therapist. Yeah. I, I just feel like if I was just going to start wearing like... What? I'm trying to think right now. I really can't it could wait be anything. to hear what it is. What if it was even something like, I was going to say like a new makeup style. Oh. Huh. It could be makeup style. Or what if it was just a baseball hat? What if today I was like, today's the day where I'm going to wear a baseball hat, but I'm going to wear it a different one. Every day. I'm going to rotate them. But I'm wearing them every single day from the second I wake up till I get in bed at night. Mm. I think you would just be like, oh, this is like a new thing. Like you're just doing a hat thing now. So no more like no more hair, like no Mm. more putting your hair up like this is it. Like you're committed to this. Yeah. So do you feel like that should have been a conversation? Like if I was just committing to a baseball hat season of life? I don't I don't think so. I don't I don't think so. No. Do you I mean, think you would have asked like once like a week or two had gone by? Well, and I've gone through baseball hat seasons of life and I feel like you haven't really made like too big of a note of it. Like like where I start wearing hats a lot more or like almost every day in the past. And and I feel like you were never like, oh, so we're doing the hat thing now. Yeah, because you still take it off like during the day. You mm. take it off. It, you take it, put it on and off all throughout the day. Yeah. And that's like I feel like more common for like a guy to throw a baseball hat on or whatever and like Interesting. wear it. Interesting. I don't know. On, on and off, but I feel like that's gender profiling. But I mean, that's fine if that's. Who I you mean, what be. if I was wearing an ascot every day? I think it'd be hot. <laughs> every day. Yeah, let's do it. Let's do matching ascots. I just. It's not an ascot like this. Like it's just a handkerchief. Like that is it? Uh, it's a handkerchief. Yeah, just tied like loosely like that. So you're not experiencing any neck chafing from that? No, it's actually helping with the neck chafe. I don't know. I feel, but what about when you're wearing t-shirts? Because I'm confused yeah, about no the t-shirt and ascot there. thing. Then, then, then it's just a habit. Now I'm just doing it. Is it a habit or I've, is it I've a statement? I've had a lot of neck chafing from shirts, but I can't say that that's 100% the reason, but it has helped on the like shirts I really like, but the collar like takes the flesh off did you see somebody wearing one and you were like t- like i liked that and now see, i've always wanted to and now i'm going to i will say i've always liked them i know you've always liked them you've always yeah. talked about it okay well see that's good there's some there's some history there that you remember that you you know that I, at least you remember me talking about it so it wasn't yeah. clearly it wasn't for sure out of nowhere i just feel like it came from it felt a little bit from nowhere and it was like a big commitment it wasn't like a hey i'm gonna try this like on yeah. sundays like where i feel a little bit more dressy I think it was hard for me when it wasn't just with a button down collar. It was like now it's a crew neck sweatshirt and an ascot mm. and t shirts and ascots. Like yeah. it kind of 
was harder for me. I'm not going to lie. And so I'm just, I had to ask you at one point, like, how committed are we? Like, am I like, do I need to be like, what? This is it for a year? I'd say the foreseeable future. Okay. I just, all right. Just kidding. Me- I'll, I'll take it off, I just need to mentally babe. process it. If you want it's me to stop It's not that. I just need to know. I just, you know me. I'm a planner. I, I need to, to. I have to keep you on your toes. I would can... you say this is part of a midlife crisis? Definitely. Okay. It's 100%. All right. I, I guess think I'll it, take it. It actually just started on a cruise. It started on the cruise, I think, when I, we went. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's when I was like, oh, you know what? I kind of like these. I know, but you did that like once on the cruise, maybe twice, but then. Was that all? Yeah, and then it was like, oh, to like dinner two months night. later. It was like, to like dinner. Every day. Okay, yeah, I don't know. Either way. Anyway, somebody sent you a picture the other day. I think it was Tyler Jamello sent you a picture. Oh my God, it was awesome. It was awesome. And then I didn't it was send a anything side back by and side. I thought I was offended. And I was oh, like, no, no, I loved it. No, so Zach fun. never sends anything back. Um, <laughs> it was a side by side of like Zach and the Ken doll from Toy I think it was Toy Story 3. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Toy yeah. Story 3. And he. Because we has, had like matching shirts on too. Yes, and. Yes little bandanas around the neck and it was really funny there, there are worse things to be compared to than the kindle i'll i'll take it Fair. i'll take it but you know um the kids picked up on it right away is um fred from go uh from uh scooby-doo, scooby-doo yeah because he always wore the the ascot That's handkerchief true. thing scarf it's like scarf. a yeah, yeah. like a guy scarf <laughs> um but yeah funny stuff i know and i watched the lost kitchen and her and her husband has the little bandana around his neck every day yeah, too. see, and he's rad. Eh. So <laughs> I'm gonna tell him you said that. No, uh, he seems like a great guy. He does. Yep. He does. So I mean for his family to be thrust onto like reality T V. Yeah, know, there it is. That's a lot. That's a lot. Anyway. Anyway. So today we wanted to talk about Ooh. drum roll, please. Wait, am I saying something? Yeah, you're okay. gonna say it. You're gonna make the big announcement. Oh, well, this isn't really like the big announcement of the topic of the day, but I did want to say one short commercial thing that I think we need to cover is somebody asked me recently, um, a good friend who I've actually, you know what, people have asked this starting last year, and we might have addressed it in a podcast last year, and I can't remember, but it was, okay, what are, it's, it's, it's quote unquote pride month, and how are we, what are we saying to our kids depending on how old they are, what they can comprehend. Like, we want to be parents that are proactive. We want to be addressing things before, like, the world's addressing them with our kids. Yeah. So how do you do that, and how do you do it, like, well, not exposing your kid to too much that they don't, like, that they really don't need to know? And Mm -hmm. I think that's where we can err on the, like, dangerous side of this, where we're trying to be, like, the parents that are, I'm going to make sure my kids know every detail and... Not comprehending like the age and what they should be able to process or what is going to actually instill like more fear and concern and worry and that kind of stuff within them. Mm -hmm. So what would you say to that? I'd say when your kids hear it from you first, there's like an exponentially greater chance of you being able to control the narrative on on the fear thing. Like I think kids are should hear i don't know i have a strong philosophy on this but they that when kids do hear it from their parents whatever it is even if it's like just a little bit or a lot or whatever you i think you can dissipate or neutralize the fear that sets in when kids are left to i mean think about it like this so let's say kids start to hear about something for the very first time out in public school Mm -hmm. or on tv So they know that there's something about it that doesn't, because in their spirit, it's going to chafe a little bit. There's something about it that doesn't 100% line up if you're like raising Christian kids yeah. because there's truth in them. And so they know that this isn't that. Honestly, I think that that thing is in every kid. I think so too. I think that's in every kid. I think think it's a little bit stronger in Christian Mm -hmm. kids, Um, but I agree. So now that chafing is there. And so... What happens is a lot of times when we do find out that our kids have been exposed to something or have learned about something or whatever, let's say that's, you know, a bully or a whatever, somebody like that's being mean to them. Um, What we tend to do then is get extreme because now they've been exposed to that somewhere else. And so by 
by getting extreme, it thrusts the kids into this like sort of like whirlwind of of you know instability like wait a minute i wasn't supposed to know that i wasn't supposed to hear that am i in trouble did i do something wrong oh no like mom and dad are acting like this is really bad like how bad is it well i think then it instills like fear and shame like there's like a shame component like maybe i should have never said anything i'm not going to say anything and kids don't have kids don't have the rubric like to th- that adults do. So when they, when kids see emotion on us or when they see yes. reaction in us, they take it to like a totally. hundred times that. Mm-hmm. And so that's why we've got to be way more careful. Like, especially parents out there that like struggle with, you know, emotional responses yes, yeah. and, and balancing that mm-hmm. and extremes, like, please hear me and know that like, we love you and we're your pastors and whatever you need, but please, for the sake of your children, like we just talked on Sunday for a few minutes about self control. Uh-huh. Like, make sure that you are not flying off in front of your kids, right? right. With any, with anything, mm-hmm. be it sadness or anger or fear or anything. Yeah, you know? it's true. No, I think that's good. And you know, when it comes to the pride stuff, I don't. I mean, I hope that there's not a lot of like fear associated with that. Um, I think staying like very calm you know if your kids come to you with it first I think staying really calm and just kind of saying we've said this to our kids like yeah you know people have chosen sinful lifestyles and they're not necessarily really bad people it's just like the sin Mm -hmm. that they've been you know they've chosen to live in and um, they're broken just like a lot of other people are broken in different areas Mm -hmm. and no we don't agree with it the bible says it's sin and you know, so we're not we're not like supporting that, and right. but we're still loving people, and we pray for people, and um, that's kind of been the conversation. We keep it really, I I keep it really super surfacey. Our kids range from eight to thirteen. I feel like they get it. I feel like they're not over. Yeah, they're not like over dramatic about it. Right. They're just like you know, the boys now will like roll, kind of like roll their eyes at it. Like, Oh, cause even this has to have like yeah. some sort of pride representation. And it's well, they, true. They and that's the like the reality. Everywhere. They see the yeah. flags everywhere, everywhere, everywhere. Um, it's, it's a red flag to them because now they've associated it with, it's not good. And I think it's not like a fear thing, but it's a, uh, something that, that they're noticing how much of it. Yeah. Is. I think it's just really important to, to keep it. It's not bad people. It's not bad people. It doesn't make people like it doesn't define who they are. Like we're praying for them. They're struggling with like identity things because they don't know who they are in Christ. There's a lot of things that cause choices and all of that kind of stuff. And it's kind of getting some of your older kids to see a little bit of the bigger picture there in not not more of like the sin corruption piece, not the corruption part of it, I guess, is what I would want to say, hmm. but kind of saying like teaching them. Like that, how, how people are broken, yeah. like in what causes, like why does certain people do this and why does certain people do that? And, and we don't want to like label people as bad because they're making sinful choices. A lot of people don't necessarily like know better. A lot of people are really lost and, but at the same time, like people have chosen paths and we're not like endorsing that and Right. Encouraging that. Yeah. So how do you talk to your kids about it? I feel like my, I feel like I've adopted this way probably, I don't know, maybe like four or five years ago. And I can't even remember what the first thing was, but, um, especially when it comes to this, it's, it's so, and this kind of goes along with that point we made a little bit earlier, but like keeping it casual so that it's like you, you, you can reference something. It can come up in a conversation like when your kids say, hey, what's that? What does that mean mm-hmm. when they see something? Or mm-hmm. what is that for? Or why Why is that sticker? What does that sticker on that back of that car mean? And um, to keep it casual in the sense of like, yeah, no big deal. Like instead of, okay, I've got to pull the car over. I guess we're going to have this conversation right, right now. Right. And like, okay, you know, and you make this whole big deal out yep. of it. It's like, nope, like this is the world we live in. Yeah. You know, people are broken, like bad stuff happens to people and affects how they make decisions. And, and, um, and always, always, always tie it back around to truth. Mm-hmm. Like, Always, always, always so that there's never a memory in your child's mind where the negative side was left hanging. Mm -hmm. 
you you bring it back around and use it to reiterate the gospel mm-hmm. of Jesus Christ. Use it to reiterate the truth of, you know, mom and dad and what what we have in our family. And we're so blessed mm-hmm. because God's healed mom and dad of these things or of whatever. And so our lifestyle is this because we believe what the Bible says. Right. So just use it every single time right. instead of just leaving it hang like yep buddy that's what the world's coming to yeah like, exactly it's such a bad like, place it's, we're going to hell in you a handbasket. like yeah. i can't imagine what it's going to be when you're older yeah. oh, oh man yeah, exactly. it's going to be a mess like i mean guys that is like literally instilling fear into your kids yeah don't do so that. we don't want to do that don't do that don't do it so um but but i think that there's so much power to just like a- almost like not blow it off but like diminish it the world wants to glorify it. If you if you drive down any street, if you turn on any channel, like all the networks, mm-hmm. they've got like a big pride section right mm-hmm. now. The world wants to glorify it. And I think that we have the privilege in the kids we're raising to diminish it, diminish it, diminish it. Like, yeah, okay, that's people who don't have anything better to stand for. Mm-hmm. They, they need to make a big deal out of the sin that they're struggling mm-hmm. with or that they're embracing. Mm-hmm. And, um, and I think that the more we diminish and downplay it, the more our kids are going to grow up not seeing this thing as this insurmountable monster right. that it's like, if we can't beat them, we better join them, you know, cause and that's and the I hope other. it doesn't come to that, but I, I just, <clears throat> I, I think we can, we can end up doing more harm than good unintentionally because we are, are we ourselves struggle with the fear mm. and the the overwhelmingness of issues at hand. So yeah, that overflows onto our kids instead. Yeah. Um, and that's where I say we could easily do like more harm than good there. Um, and, you know, as adults, we do see a bigger picture. We see, I, I mean, I have really strong feelings on a lot of the agenda stuff being pushed. My kids don't need to know that. They don't need to know that. They, are, they don't have the capacity at this point mm. to comprehend it. And even if they do, like, the 13 year old, he does have the comprehension to be able to do that. I don't want that in his mind. I don't need him worrying about it, thinking about it, all of that. You don't have to be worrying about government conspiracies at 13 years old. Right. I mean, he is reading Hunger Games. But... <laughs> <laughs> I I will say that one other thing on this. So uh, a great friend of ours, a, an awesome young woman in the church, just one who we both respect came and visited me the other day and was a little concerned with how I had said something about gay dads in a message a couple of weeks back. And, oh, it was the, it was the day that John shared the big prophetic word out of Habakkuk and, or Habakkuk, depending on which Bible school you went to. And so I said, I was, I was making a point of how like it used to be, you would pull the dad card, like, oh, my dad can beat your dad up or whatever, you know? And then I said, yeah, that is until like, you know, everybody's dads were gay or something like now, that. Now, do you feel like that was in the flesh? Hmm. You were in your flesh when you made that statement? I don't actually, when I think back Zachary on it. Zachary Thomas Lenz. The point I'm making is that the young woman that came and visited and she was like, she's not gay affirming or anything like that, but she has some friends and whatever that she's whatever talking to people that she's trying to minister to. And she was like, Hey, you know, like, do you feel like you're a little light on this stuff? Like you bring it up jokingly. Like that tends to be kind of like a a thing. And I said, I really appreciate you coming in. We talked about it for a long time. It was a much bigger conversation than that, but I feel this and I think it's a part of this conversation. That's why I'm bringing it up because I feel like we are taught as conservatives to the world wants us, even if they're going to acknowledge that we vote a certain way, that our ethics are a certain way, that our values are a certain way. We are taught to walk on eggshells around the other stuff and that we are criminalized and villainized for not respecting it as a way of life. Mm-hmm. And I think that honestly, when and again, when we're raising our kids, like use a little wisdom, like Ashley just said, be conscious of the age and the appropriateness of what they can process mm-hmm. and how they can evaluate. But I feel like in the church and yes, even on a Sunday morning, like 
if you don't have to be around long to know that our philosophy of Sunday mornings, which may be a good another podcast topic, but we're not really there for our Sunday mornings are more of a celebration and a an encouragement and a strengthening of the body more than they are like an evangelistic outreach. Right. Fair. Mm -hmm. Some churches, that's their Sunday morning. For us, we have other ministries and other things that we'd say that's more of the focus of those things. Um, Sunday mornings are pretty deep. They're like really long worship and really deep messages and things like that. Whether that's right or wrong or just a style, I whatever, we're not here to argue that. The point is, I feel like it's an opportunity to sort of rally everyone around, hey, I know what the world is saying. We know what the news is saying. We know what flags are waving out there. We need to talk about what we're standing for in here. And part of that is we're not going to walk on eggshells. We're not going to be nicey nice or, or season our language with um, ambiguous words so that nobody ever gets offended. Um, I think the idea is not we're not here to offend people. We're here to remind people of this isn't just stuff that we think it's stuff that we believe in stuff that we stand on and stuff that matters to who we are as Christians. I totally agree. And I'm, I'm, I mean, I don't think there's anything wrong necessarily with like seasoning things to like, um, you know, have a, the desired result where you're not trying to like offend somebody. And I think that that is where it can be a really slippery slope. I think it's easy and maybe this is like where the flesh part we have to like continue continue to crucify because it's our flesh that desires to like offend. And when we're saying things, we can be super flippant and, well, I'm just joking. Like everybody here like knows me or whatever. And it's like, no, that's not necessarily true. Like maybe not. And it's can be offensive. And I don't think... I think for the sake of people, I'm kind of like, all right, what would Jesus do in a situation like this? Like where, like, would he be like mocking sinners or was it like, hey, like maybe they'll like sense love somehow? See, the thing is about a, a case like that is that wasn't really a joke. That's like a hundred percent true about there was a time when people looked at their fathers as an example of masculinity and leadership and strength and whatever. And there was a time when you knew that your dad could defend you. I don't think that, I think the point that I was making, the truth that I was making was maybe being made a little too crass. Okay. But the, the point. I just need you to just like say not, that out loud in front the, of all your friends. But the point was not that, the point was not to make a joke. The point was to say, hey, this generation does not have fatherhood the way that generations in the past have. I totally agree with you, and I know exactly what you're saying. Yeah. I don't necessarily believe that the point was not to make a joke, but we can watch the playbacks. Oh, it was like a pretty intense moment. It wasn't really a joke. But anyway, I didn't hear anybody laughing, that's for sure. Zachary Thomas. What? I'm going to have to replay all these tapes for you. Oh, no. You I must think have been it, in a I different service. pretty intense. Yeah, was, maybe. I don't know. Mm -mm. Anyway, all aside, the point is that that don't don't allow this thing, even if you're, even if you're, see, I, I think that we make this mistake. We raise our kids um, knowing the difference between right and wrong, and we teach them that right is right, but, but we leave it open to to the point that they can fear what's wrong. And I think that that is the mistake. I feel like one of my charges in life is to make sure that my kids are never afraid of bad things, that they're, they don't walk in fear of what the world is doing or uh, that they don't feel like that they have to live their lives around this. I don't see Jesus doing that at all. And so I think that if we're if we're uh, like teaching by example or by lesson, then we're really setting our kids up to like live in the shadow of the darkness of this world. Because you don't feel like there's any place for like healthy fear, like to keep you from doing things. Like it shouldn't be a healthy fear that's kind of like keeping you from drunk driving or like it's kind of you're saying you sh should have the ability to like make the choice not to do it. Based on the fact that they learned what was right. 
like you don't have to learn the hard way. We're we're teaching you the easy way, mm-hmm. you know, the right way. I don't know. Anyway, interesting. It's a lot there, but know your kids. Like know what they're know what they can handle, know what they can process and watch their face and when it seems like they start to get confused or overwhelmed like <laughs> backpedal. Like like don't don't just keep driving a point home like if they're not able don't have the capacity at their age to yeah. handle it. Yeah, you know? I think if you're more of a practical person, I think have like three or four like solid statements that you feel really good about before you go and talk to your kid. Like don't just like try something and then oh you're my gosh, like you're such a planner. I know, like like drowning. <laughs> I think having like some good, okay, like these are some like clear statements that like make sense that they'll understand that, um, I, I don't know if like watching their face and then you have to backpedal is necessarily like, oh, and I've gone too far now. Like maybe these, I don't know. <laughs> well, well, I just mean to is say, is that how you live I, your life? I, I only you mean watch to the say resp- that. You watch people's facial expressions. And then backpedal. Time to backpedal. No, I just mean read Babe, the Babe, I think I need my face to be more dramatic in that case. <laughs> <laughs> backpedal backpedal <laughs> oh my gosh that's funny no just read the room and 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 be aware of right. like wait that was a big bite they just bit off right. so let them chew on it for a while before you put another not the next bite in like like let them chew on it <laughs> and your kids will think about what you tell them mm-hmm. like they'll think yeah. about it they'll i think like, it's important to like instead of you doing all the talking have your like couple things that you want to say and like, let them ask questions. Kids always want to ask questions. Leave room for our kids to ask questions. Say, do you have anything? Like, is, does that make you think about anything? Do you have any questions about that? Have you seen this anywhere where you've mm-hmm. like wondered about it? Um, give space for your kids to like respond, not just yeah. lecture. That's good. Yeah, well, I, we had a really great conversation in the ride up to Maine and uh, with the boys. I had the boys captive audience for five hours in the truck. They must love and, that. And well, like you said, I you know for maybe one out of two of them at least, they probably appreciated not having to look me in the face like for the th- ride. But they had really great questions. They had really great questions. And I was like really proud of the fact that have how they're like processing things. And mm-hmm. even like, okay, if so if if that is the way it is, dad, like why does the Bible say this about this? Mm-hmm. And like, you know, that's the way to my heart is theology. So it's like, all right, like let's go there. But I was so proud of them holding up what they're learning to truth that's already there and finding out how do we reconcile this with what we believe about that and and okay, well, A, B, and C are in the Ten Commandments. And why is this one written differently somewhere else? Mm-hmm. And, you know, that sort of thing. And so it's, it was just like such good conversation. And that is what we want. That's what we ought to covet with our kids is, you know, that those kind of moments. Mm-hmm. So good. good. Well, that wasn't supposed to be our full topic of the day, but now I'm like, it's well, been a little we bit, could still a little hit while. Something else. What do you have to hit? What do you have to hit? Oh my. So one thing that, um, one thing that's been on my heart a little bit, and I will share this because I agree. I think that we we spend a lot of time, and you've heard Ashley, you out there listening, you've heard Ashley and I talk about, um, you know, judging people's fruit and mm-hmm. how we're supposed to be fruit inspectors, you know, and, and there's sort of a mandate on us as believers to like be observing the fruit of really anything, anything as we're taking it in, as we're deciding we want this tree growing in our yard or whatever, like make sure that it's good fruit. What's it producing? What's the fruit of the church you go to, of the ministry you're part of? What's the fruit of your own ministry, of your own life? But I was recently kind of taking inventory of a ministry that we um, are familiar with, kind of adjacent to, and I was thinking about how over the years, maybe like uh, over a decade now of watching changes in this ministry and it's been around a long time but when you when I've I've only been watching it closely as someone in ministry for like maybe a decade or so as you watch changes in leadership changes in structure changes in you know process and operation and whatever a lot of them are one at a time wouldn't seem like the end of the world it might seem like a hard thing might seem like a whatever but when you add them up it starts to look like you know, compromise starts to look like just, okay, the values aren't the same here. The, the whatever aren't the same. However, as conversations come up, there's this thought of, well, the fruit is still there, Mm -hmm. right? The end result is still there. And so, I don't know, I would ask you like, what are your thoughts on that? When the Bible says you are to judge the fruit, 
right? Okay, we know that. We can't judge the heart. The point is you Mm -hmm. can judge the fruit, not the heart, right? Mm -hmm. Because the heart is the Lord's to judge. When you see, okay, you're looking a little bit further up the food chain, and not everybody does. The vast majority of people don't. And maybe because like when you are leading something, when you're closer to the fire, you end up seeing more of what goes in it. Right. What are your thoughts on, let's just say, a church or an organization or a ministry or whatever that now is doing something that is very contradictory to your own convictions? I think it's so hard. That's such a hard question because, you know, I think about, I think it's Paul who says, you know, as long as Christ is being preached, like it doesn't necessarily like matter who's like right. doing it. And and then it's like, as okay, as long as Christ is being preached because people are hearing the gospel. So like, that's what actually matters. But what that doesn't matter for is the person who's doing the preaching. And like, that's on them at that point, you know, mm-hmm. like I think about, whatever people, you know, casting out to the seven sons of Sceva, where it's like people are casting out demons and don't actually like know the Lord, really. It doesn't mean that people aren't getting saved, that people's lives aren't being changed because right. the power is like still there. So when it's like in a ministry, I think it's so hard. I think you, you can judge the fruit we're called to. And so you can do that. And if there's like other stuff, I think you just kind of hope that people aren't exposed to some of the garbage sometimes. I think it's like the exposure piece that yeah. kind of gives you like the bitter taste in your mouth and you're like, I don't know if I even want to support this ministry anymore. Mm-hmm. You know, and I look at stuff coming out on on like Hillsong and you're watching stuff about all these different ministries that have failure somewhere in their inner workings. Yeah. And it's like, okay, so now do we not do Hillsong? You like throw out everything. Like do you throw out the baby with the bathwater? And I'm kind of like, no, of course not. You know, Israel Houghton divorced his wife and had an affair and people are like, oh, stop listening to any Israel Houghton music and don't play any of his songs. And there's part of me that's just kind of like, there's sin everywhere. You know, it's like nobody's perfect. Everybody's still broken. And right. I don't know. What do you think? Do you think that that's like bad to be like that? I think you have to know yourself too. Like sometimes it just doesn't sit right with you and you're like, yeah, I just can't support that anymore. Yeah. And that's like on you. That's like in your own spirit. I think you don't go like trash talk people's ministries or like right. all of that and kind of be like, well, I feel like it's my job to let you know all of like the inner workings and what garbage is going on at right. headquarters Right. when it's like, yeah. When it's a blessing in somebody's life, I don't think that that, I think you're actually in the wrong at that point. Yeah. Well, so a couple of weeks ago when we were talking about the slave girl that was going around and um, announcing Paul and Silas and saying, these are servants of the most high God. And we talked about promotion and how unhealthy promotion can be. At some point in that message, there was the point, the point was made, Satan would rather you be leading people in the sinner's prayer Mm -hmm. than yourself being led into the place of prayer. Right. What I think is when you take into account, not just the big celebrity pastors that have fallen because they're all like such easy targets. But when you take into account um, even like local ministries or local churches or 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 things in our own church, mm-hmm. like right, right in our own backyard here, um, when you take into account the things of how we can get distracted by production of fruit. We can get distracted. Like I think of what was the the nineteen sixties, and they came out with like pesticides, and they're advertising the fact that they're like du- crop dusting fields with like radioactive chemicals that make the leaves like brighter and greener, and like oh look, and there's no bugs on this, there's no holes in this, or whatever. And and there were like commercials that were showing these like planes crop dusting everything. It's like, look what we can do to make your vegetables look better on the shelves or whatever. And now people are like horrified. Like people are like, what? Like this is an outrage. Like they'd probably be arrested and like put out of business. Why? Because it wasn't just about the fruit. At the end of the day, it's about the fruit inspection is like, well, that fruit looks great sitting in that bowl on that table. Or that, that fruit looks great, like as I even take the first bite and it tastes good. But if it gives you cancer five years later, if it if it kills you 10 years later, and that's the thing about some of these things when, when we can't just say, okay, if we're going to judge fruit, we can't just judge fruit on the immediate result of, yeah, a bunch of people are getting saved. So, yeah, of course. All right. Of course. No, well, what's no, the, I think what? these are two, like, two different things. What's the what's the what's the ten year run on that fruit? 
did it end up becoming a cancer spiritually in people's lives? And now are the countless people who came in under that leadership or, or through that ministry, the people whose quote unquote lives were changed, were they not really transformed because they ended up coming full circle and are worse off in their addictions or in their lives or in their whatever than they were before? I just feel like from a church standpoint, and you know, again, Maybe as pastors, it's easier to look church to church, but it really goes across the board, ministry to ministry and organization to organization and whatever. I think that the Lord is calling us to a little bit different than just the surface value, judge the fruit and say, ah, it's fine. You know, I do to a degree. I don't know how much time everybody needs to be like spending judging people's like fruit necessarily. Like I think you can. If you need to, if you're like trying to say, oh, this person's going to be my kid's mentor or they're going to be working for me in a ministry capacity or. Yeah, based um, on how invested you are. Yeah, I don't know if it's just like we need to be people out there like analyzing the fruit of every ministry and like judging whether or not the ministry was good because 10 years later, a lot of people like left the fellowship. I don't I don't know. I get what you're saying. I just don't necessarily know. If that's what believers need to be like. Yeah. Well, so concerned with here's what believers do need to be concerned with. Okay. I feel like when the father says and, you know, we see it, we see him speaking this over Jesus. Um, we see this. This has become the mantra of every um, of every funeral service and celebration of life. You know, we all want those words. We all want to hear that line. Well done. Good and faithful servant. Right. Um, we want this, uh, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased and well done. We want to hear that well done, Mm -hmm. but here's something, right? When, when I see the Lord speaking that, when I see that being said over folks, that is not in reference to just what you produced. The well done is how you did it. Right. It's how you achieved the result. Mm Mm-hmm. It's, it's how you, it's not just the end, it's mm-hmm. the means well done means you did it right. Yeah. Not just, not just you, you, you did a good thing, right, but right. you did it the right way. And so I think it's so true. And you said that yesterday in staff, it's not what you do, it's how you do it. And I think that it's so, so, so true. And I think that that's what we need to be like holding ourselves up to. Well, like you just said a second ago, you said, okay, so instead of, instead of being so worried about like. Uh, the is that pastor doing something behind the scenes? Is that why he's wearing expensive shoes? Or is mm-hmm. that why he's whatever looking flashy? Instead of being so concerned about that and like whatever, it's it's more of on yourself. Yeah, absolutely. Because it is very possible that that quote unquote celebrity pastor or multi million dollar ministry, it's very possible that the heart in there is more pure than, than yours, yours is. Absolutely. And and that is thank you Pastor Kurt because now this one's flying around our house esteeming others higher than yourselves, mm-hmm. greater than yourselves. Um and to the Philippian church, um the idea is it's so easy. It can become so easy to in a in an effort to promote your own holiness or righteousness mm-hmm. or whatever, you can you can condescend, you can um uh, I mean, there's whatever, plenty of words for it, but really esteeming others is to look at those ministries and to say, you know what? We don't know what was going on in Israel Houghton's marriage. We mm-hmm. don't know what was going on. So, was Like it, you actually don't. Was, Even if you hear a lot of information and a lot of stories don't. and you've watched all the documentaries, yeah. you still don't because you yeah. are not one of those two people that were married. Right. And it, yeah. So unless you're like best friends and have sat down and counseled with both of them together, like even if you knew one of them, right. you're not hearing I the know. other side. Of stuff. Absolutely. Like, so, so I I feel like at the end of the day, the Bible does tell us to judge fruit, mm-hmm. but but what's more important than judging other people's fruit is judging your own heart. For sure. Is really okay. Judgment begins in the house of the Lord. Mm-hmm. Well, where does He live mm-hmm. in your heart? And so if we're not willing to check your motivations, if we're not willing, yeah, to be real with ourselves and and to say, okay, I'm going to stand before the Lord and, and I'm not just going to have to answer for my fruit. God does not just inspect fruit. Right. He inspects the heart. Absolutely. And so we have to be able to say, Hey, not only did I do the right thing, but my heart was actually right at the time. Right. And you know, what's so beautiful about that? The times when you do screw something up, 
like there's so much peace in saying, okay, Lord, but what were my heart intentions with this? Mm -hmm. God, show me my heart. Yeah. And sometimes it's like, you know what? I was after the right thing here. Right. And what I learned is I can't get the right thing the wrong way. Mm -hmm. You know, it's so true. And, and that is a really hard thing. It's one of those things that is so much easier said than done when you go into difficult situations and you're like, okay, I know the end game I'm going for here. Like, and I know how to achieve it. And how do I do that with like actually having the right motives and doing it the right way and not just how I know to do it. I think especially for people who have been Christians for a long time, you know the right way to do everything. You yeah. know the right answers for everything. You know how to make things look good. You know how to make things look like, oh, yeah, well, I was just doing that. Like, I was just serving a sister. Like, I was just making sure... Like, I mean, there's a bill, billion ways to even cover up gossip because we're like, Matthew I just, I was Matthew 18ing. I was um, making sure she like, all of that, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> whatever. You know, you know, Truth you know. Truth in love. Truth in love. <laughs> yeah. Don't do that. Um, all right. That's good. This is long. It's Sorry. too long. Sorry, Ben. Oh, jeez. Um, we got to go. Yeah. You can break this up and listen to it in uh, 15 minute increments if you want, but all the we, different topics it can be like different yeah, podcasts. We probably should have said that at the beginning. <laughs> the Ascot podcast. The, <laughs> Ascot's Pride Month and Heart Over Fruit. There it is. Lord, we just uh we need you. We need you. God, we're just going to mess this up without you. And so, uh Lord, I pray for just a, a a growing desperation in our hearts to know you more, to to love you stronger and to let you love us, God, in the way that you want to. And so um, we just we want to honor the truth that is within us. We want to honor, um, Lord, the gift and the, the high calling of raising kids and of um, influencing our community, God. And I thank you, God, for all of our brothers and sisters who are listening today and, and, and all the influence that they carry in their homes and in their workplaces and in their spheres of friends and greenhouses and all the different things, Lord, the, the places we walk. So, Lord, help us to do that in a way that... Um, is conscious not just of that end result, but really, Lord, where our heart is all along the way. And we love you and we thank you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Our house friends and family, thank you for stopping by and we'll see you next Friday on Our House. This is Nestor. And I'm Willa. This is Our House from A to Z. Thanks for coming over. Mother. It's a rite of passage. Mother, I crave violence. Oh. <laughs>